really glad that you're not me right now. And um, I was just sitting there thinking, um, the Bishop of London and then Rick Warren, and there's a piece of meat in between that, um, those two pieces of bread. And like one has sold a book that's, you know, second only to the Bible in terms of how many have been sold. The Bishop of London had two billion people watching one of his um, wedding ceremonies and, so, and one of the rest of you are kind of like, who is she? But um, <laughs> I thought it would be just like God to drop me right in the midst of all of that. So I'm here representing most of us who are pretty much nameless and faceless nobodies having a go for God, wanting to make a difference. And um, I pray that really... What I have to share will inspire and encourage us all to rise up and be all that God's called us to be and do all that God's called us to do. I was so captivated by the bishop. He could have just kept talking. And um, I tried to make my voice posh. And this is what happens when you leave the motherland and come from Australia and you're just one of the convicts from the colonies. But I am Greek. <laughs> I am both Greek and a woman. My husband actually has a British passport. He's as British as they come, his, his mother is. But um, he said, you should not say that you're Greek at the moment. You shouldn't stand up in Europe at all and actually <laughs> admit that. So you apologized on behalf of the Americans, but I'm apologizing on behalf of the Greeks for bankrupting the planet. But um, <laughs> we do a lot of things well. I'm both Greek and a woman, so... Um, you know, I only speak hard, fast and continuously. You will not fall asleep, I promise you that much. And I was sitting in the front row kind of vacillating. I, I, I so love Nick and I have become great friends with um, Nikki and Pippa and um, we thank God that God has raised up Holy Trinity Brompton and um, in this day and in this hour to unify so much of the body of Christ. You know, we've had them down in Sydney, absolutely love them. And I am so thrilled that this is really a season in church. I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm alive right now because being a woman, if I was, you know, it would have been not long ago that I wouldn't have been able to be standing here, so I am glad that I'm alive now, that we live in a time in church history where we can have on one platform the Bishop of London, we've got a Benedictine monk, we've got a raving Pentecostal, we've got a woman, we've just got the body of Christ. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. And... Um, I'm a little bit of an amalgamation of all of them. Grew up a staunch Greek Orthodox for 18 years. Didn't go into a Protestant church pretty much until I was um, in my 20s. I had gone to a mission at the University of Sydney. A friend of mine took me to that mission and said to me, there is a Greek Cypriot that is speaking. And, um, and I went along because I just didn't know that Greeks could be Protestants. And so I went... And there was this funny little man called J. John that was, um, yeah, I thought you'd all know him, that was doing a mission. And um, I just really uh, was very, I, I'm trying to think of the words he uses, and so I don't, I don't want to misrepresent it. But I, I was probably very verbose and very anti a lot of what he was doing. So he took me out for coffee, his team, um, every night. And he, sometimes he preaches a message that says sometimes it takes more than one coffee. And we did kind of five nights straight of coffee. But by the end of that fifth night, um, I pretty much recommitted my life to Christ and have been going full on since then. So it's amazing how God has used all of us. And that was 20 odd years ago. And, um, and since then, I've been part of the leadership team at the Hillsong Church for 23 years. People get excited when they see a blonde chick from the Hillsong Church because they'll think, that I'm going to start singing. And um, <laughs> the truth is, if I was to sing Shout to the Lord today, you would all cry to the Lord. So that's not going to happen. I definitely don't sing, but I've been part of the, the broader team and now I'm part of our global teaching team. And um, Nick and I oversee the A21 campaign, which we help to rescue the victims of human trafficking. And we have offices in seven countries, predominantly in Eastern Europe. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that. But I want to dive right into the Word. And just before I do, I want you to see a, a DVD that um, we've just kind of prepared. It's a little bit ridiculous, but um, I'm just not sure what to do after the Bishop of London. So this DVD will do, and then I'll start. So if you guys want to play that. Hi, everyone. Do you want to play a game? Come on, come play with me. Don't you want to play a game? Come on, play a game with me. Let's play a game. Let's play a game called... 
find everything in your parents' house that's expired. This game is so easy. Okay, so pause this video and go find everything in your parents' house that's expired. Welcome back! So, to begin, I went to my parents' fridge, and I think I won. October 30th, 2008. July 23rd, 2008. December 15th, 2007. December 8th, 2006. July 15th, 2006. December 13th, 2007. I don't think Pixie Sticks have an expiration date, but when was the last time a child was in this house? Expired. It's gotta be expired. Oh no, this isn't looking good. June 27th, 2004. Expired. July 26th, 2008. Expired. 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 December 21st, 2008. Not yet expired! Let's have some Italian! Oh, this isn't looking promising. Oh my goodness. October 1992. Expired. Did I win? Did I beat you? I had a lot of good stuff this round. No? You had more expired stuff than me? Well, okay, just just wait, okay? Just hold your hold your horses, because I have the checkmate of this game. Do you see this packaging? I want you to guess how old this is. August 8th, 1966. EXPIRED! If there's one thing I think I learned from this game, it's that my parents don't believe in expiration dates. So, if you ever come over to my house to eat sometime, don't have anything. Why I love that is he was talking about things that have expired, and when he said this phrase, he said the phrase that, if you come to my place to eat, don't have anything because my parents don't believe in expiration dates, it's like something went off in my spirit when he said that. Because I thought not only do his parents not believe in expiration dates, but I believe that we serve a God that doesn't believe in expiration dates. And really this morning, as I was listening to Judah talk last night, and I was listening to the bishop right now, and I've been coming to this region of the world every year, at least eight or nine times a year for the last 15 years. The one thing that I think we need more than anything else as leaders is to trust that he who promised is faithful. That if God spoke a promise over your business, over your calling, over your ministry, over your life, that even if it looks in the natural, that that promise has expired. That there is no way that it can come to pass. That there is no way that your ministry can go forward. That there is no way that you'll see the breakthrough in that business. That, you know, Wall Street or the London Exchange says that, that the economy is so bad that nothing can happen. I want Want to speak faith to us this morning because without faith it's impossible to please God and more than anything else as leaders in the 21st century I believe we need to learn up to stir up that gift of faith on the inside of us so that we can believe for another generation that God is who he says he is that Jesus will do what he said he will do that all the promises of God are in him yes and in him amen that he who promised is faithful and I think we need to come right, right back to who we believe in, what we are believing God for, and what we're believing God to do in our nation. You know, we often talk about Joshua saying that he's a leader that was absolutely awesome. I'm not actually convinced that he was. Because when we get into the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 10, to me, it's the saddest scripture in the Bible. The Bible says that when Joshua and his generation died, Another generation arose that did not know the Lord, nor the works that he had done for Israel. What a sad indictment it would be of the leaders of the church of Jesus Christ in the year 2012. If another generation arises in England, if another generation arises across the world that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, nor the works that he has done throughout history in his church. You see, we don't have an option to quit. We don't have an option to stop carrying the baton of faith from one generation to the next. We've got the Olympic Games coming here in London in July. Well, you know, I was thinking as they're building the Olympic stadiums, I was, I was thinking about the, the women's 4 by 100 meter relay that was held both in 2004 in Athens and 2008 in Beijing. Now, the interesting thing is that the USA women's team should have won the Olympics in Athens. <laughs> Should have won. They had the fastest team. They had the fastest four individual runners. They should have crossed the line first, but something happened in the exchange zone. The entire race hinged on the exchange zone. You know, you can have a relay race and you can have four individual really 
fast runners. But until the last person crosses the line, nobody wins. And if one person is disqualified, everybody is disqualified. Marion Jones came into the exchange zone. It's a 20 meter zone. The entire race hinges on that 20 meters. And when she came into the zone, she slowed down a little bit because she was fatigued from having done so many, as from competing in the long jump the day before. Lauren Williams took, over, took off a little bit early. So by the time, and this will have to do as a relay baton, I'm sorry, it's the best we can do, it's a, it's a drumstick. By the time Marion Jones came into the exchange zone, Lauren Williams had taken off and she couldn't get the baton into her hand in time. And Lauren Williams grabbed the baton outside of the exchange zone. And because she grabbed it outside of the exchange zone, they were disqualified. Marion Jones was winning coming into that race. Well, then in 2008 Beijing Olympics, when they should have won again, this time in the exchange zone, as she came in and handed it to runner number three, they dropped the baton in the exchange zone. And so the American team was disqualified again. The fastest team, fastest individual runners, and the whole team was disqualified because they dropped the baton in the exchange zone. Four years before, the entire team was disqualified because they passed the baton too late and it was outside of the exchange zone. And the way one generation will not hear about the incredible faithfulness of God is if our generation of leaders either hands the baton from one generation to the next too late, or whether we drop the baton in the exchange zone because somewhere along the line we forgot what we were running towards. You see, it doesn't matter how gifted or how talented any one of us is individually. It doesn't matter how big our ministries are, how big our churches are, how big our businesses are, how much money we have, how popular we are, how famous we are. If we do not get the baton of faith into the hands of the next generation, then we have not run our race and finished our course. It's not about how great we are. God's promises do not expire. They go from one generation to the next. And in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm flicking over to a different message right now. Because we are part of a divine relay. We are not part of an individual sprint. It's not about my denomination or your denomination. It's not a gender issue. It's not a who's got the biggest ministry issue or who's got the biggest business issue. Our world just wants to keep getting bigger and better. We don't even have celebrities anymore. We've got idols. It's all about who's the biggest, who's the best, who's the greatest. And what we need is a generation of leaders across every sphere of society. Whether we're involved in fighting injustice, whether we're involved full-time in building God's church, whether we're involved in building a business to the glory of God, to help finance the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter what sphere of influence we're in or leadership we're in, we have to be committed to running our leg of the divine relay with integrity. Paul says that we're here to run our race and finish our course. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon and it's part of a relay. We're part of a divine, eternal relay. We didn't just get here. We didn't just suddenly arrive in England and suddenly we're it. We are part of something that's been going on for generations before us. And how we run in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015 will determine what comes after us. And what legacy are we going to leave? What is the legacy of the church of Jesus Christ on the earth? Currently, we have more slaves in the world than we've ever had in the history of humanity. I don't know about you, that's not okay with me. If we're supposed to shine the light and the love and the mercy and the justice and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we ought to be a church that is potent. We ought to be a church where the light dispels the darkness and illuminates the darkness around us with life and answers. We have a responsibility to carry the baton of faith from one generation to the next. Last night, Judah talked about our spirits being vexed. 
And my prayer is that when we come here, we're not just going to have information added to our data bank. More information, more principles, more strategies, more objectives. Yes, we need all of that. But if there's not a passionate heart that is so committed to seeing Jesus Christ have his way on our earth today, then you can have all of the objectives and all of the strategies and all of the principles But there's got to be a fire on the inside that says, God, I trust that you who promised are faithful. I trust that your word will come true. What you have said in your word will come to pass. That all the promises of God are in Christ, not in the stock market, not in the political system, not in the media, not in the education department, but are in Christ. Yes and amen. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are the hope of the world. We need to get a revelation of who we are in Him and what He has called us to do on the earth so that we can passionately transform the world around us. God has not called us to just do church but to be the church that makes such a difference in the world today. How do I know we are part of a divine relay? Turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Did you bring your Bible? I know it's a Christian leaders conference, so it's a novelty. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm getting there. The Bible says, therefore then. Therefore, brother, since we have confidence, that's really good. That's chapter 10. It's all good. I'll go to 12 now. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As I travel around the world, there is such a sense of hopelessness. So many leaders growing weary and losing heart, depleting and feeling depleted in their faith. And dare I suggest the only reason any of us would ever feel depleted is because we've lost sight of our source of completion. Our source of completion is not in how many people come to our church. It's not ultimately in how well we speak or how many business deals we do or what public accolades we get or what public applause we get, our source of completion can only be found in Christ. Paul says, I'm convinced of this very thing, that he, Jesus, who started this awesome work of faith in us, is the one that will bring it to completion. And I think God's saying to his church, would you look back to me? You've come to the end of yourselves. How many more light shows do we want? How many more sound systems? How many more the next trendiest? I love it when people come to Hillsong Conference. It's kind of like, let me look at what, what's the color of the carpet? What's the song list? What's Joel Houston wearing today? How long is Darlene's hair? And I'm like, seriously, as if any of that is going to make any difference. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the presence of God. It's all about who He is. If you've come to this conference... Just to get a new song list. You're missing something. Paul says, therefore then. I love that. And Paul says, the writer to the Hebrew says, therefore then. Why is he saying that? He's reminding us that we are part of a divine relay. And he's saying, church, and this is right where we are. We are in the spiritual exchange zone. What we do in this 20 meter exchange zone will determine the future of England. You heard what the bishop just said. That's what made me shift messages when I was sitting in the front row. It just went into my spirit when he said that. We are at such a pivotal time in history. We're in the spiritual exchange zone. Are we going to drop the baton and be disqualified? Or are we going to hand the baton on too late 
so the next generation doesn't even get it? See, some of us, the greatest leadership principle you're going to learn at this conference is that you've been hanging on to some batons for way too long. And by the time you hand it on, it's too late. And we've got to start right back at runner number one again. Rather than going from runner one to runner two to runner three to runner four to going, okay, I've got this baton for this season and I'm holding the baton of faith till I hand it on to another generation. I don't want to be like Joshua. I don't want another generation to arise after me that does not know the Lord nor the works that He has done. I want a generation that knows God, that runs faster, that runs stronger, that goes further than any of us have ever gone. But it takes strong leaders to understand when to hand a baton over and when to hold on to a baton and hand it over at the last second in the exchange zone. It also takes strong, because I know there's both age groups in this room. It also takes very strong recipients of a baton to understand the nuances of being in an exchange zone. Because this is my concern for the younger generation. I've spent 20 odd years in full-time youth ministry, telling a generation that they could be all that God's called them to be, they could do all that God's called them to do. But I have a lot of concerns because we have a generation in the exchange zone that isn't willing to have run leg one and leg two so they've got the strength to carry the baton in leg three. We've got a generation that just wants to run the last leg and get all the glory. We've got a generation that says, give me that baton. I want to start right where you are. I don't want to do any time in obscurity or anonymity where God can prepare me for the thing that he's already prepared for me, where God can develop me on the inside so that I can become who I need to be to do what God's called me to do. I just want the microphone. I just want the platform. I just want to start at the top of the business sector. I just want to start right up the front. Nobody ever started right up the front. Nobody ever just got a baton. We go, there's so many suddenlies in the Bible. Yes, but most of those suddenlies took at least 20 years, at least, in anonymity and obscurity of God preparing a person for the thing that he'd already prepared for them. We're like, I want it. Or we actually have a generation that says, oh, I don't know if I want that baton, pastor. I don't like the color of it. I don't like what it looks like. I don't want to serve in that ministry. I don't feel called. I'm not led. It's not part of my gift mix. It's not where I fit on the disc profile. It's not my love language. I love it. We write Christian books to excuse Christians from being Christians. The truth is, guys, there is only one love language. It's called die to self and do whatever God has called you to do. That's what it is. Crucify your flesh. Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I tell you, we'd get a whole lot further if some of us had some of those thoughts that went, you know what, God, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I don't want to just grab the baton out of someone's hand prematurely because you'll drop it. Because your worm of faith is not strong enough to take the seed and bring it to fruition. God's building in the places of anonymity and obscurity as you're running in leg one and running in leg two and running in leg three, doing those things that you think nobody notices. God's building you. Because your gift will take you rapidly to a place that your character will never keep you and the gift that is on you will destroy you if what is in you can't sustain you. It will. And we have a world where people are shooting like out of the the cannon and falling because if there is a disparity between your inner world and your outer world, your world will collapse. And it's what you do in anonymity and obscurity that will build your inner world that will develop your strength and your endurance and your tenacity. But if you're in an exchange zone going, well, you know, I don't think I want that. I don't want to do this little area in business. I don't like admin. I don't like serving. I don't want to work any overtime. Pastor, I don't feel led to do that. I don't want to do And we just pick and choose. And all over, we're just dropping batons of faith. We're just dropping them. And we're leaving a gap. And there are empty relay lanes. Empty lanes. Because we don't want to pick up the baton. I don't want to stay morally pure because, you know, I mean, it's a bit 20th century, really. No one else in London is, so why should I? So we just drop the baton of morality. 
I don't want my business ethics. Well, you know, if I lie or cheat a little bit, it doesn't really matter. Who's going to notice whatever you need to do just to get ahead? And we just drop the baton of integrity and character. And it just doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if I watch a little bit of porn. Who's really going to notice? And it's not really like trafficking girls, Christine, because I'm not going into the brothels and I'm just downloading. And it really doesn't matter. And God does it and we just drop the baton. And very soon we see the very moral fabric of our societies disintegrate. And it's not because the world's really dark and the devil's really strong. The only way anything ever gets dark is because of the absence of light. And when you turn the light switch off by dropping the baton, then the world gets dark. Don't blame the world. What we need are leaders who in the exchange zone have got integrity in every area. Might not sound cool or trendy, but the truth of the matter is the reason our world is so dark is because of the absence of light, because somewhere we turn the light switches off and we just thought it doesn't matter, as if somehow telling the truth doesn't matter, as if somehow moral purity doesn't matter, as if somehow family fidelity doesn't matter, as if somehow building a church full of vision and, and, and mission and passion and transforming our societies doesn't matter. It just becomes a, a boring religious obligation and we've creedalized and bureaucratized and institutionalized our Christianity and we've taken the very life out of it. We've taken the very passion out of it and we, we just it, it, you know, stimulate our intellect rather than putting our passion and our life and our heart into it. You can only carry a baton of faith when you are passionate and on fire and you don't have to be Pentecostal to be passionate. You don't have to be a woman to be passionate. That's why when God first and foremost says, I want your heart, because your heart is the seat of your passion. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, not just your head. There's nothing wrong with emotions and heart. It's heart that carries you over the line. It's heart that makes you pass the baton on. I love passion because passion, you do what you want from passion. You do what you have to when it's a boring religious obligation. You know, my husband, the most ravishing piece of masculine flesh ever, sitting here in the front row. <laughs> we met when we were in Bible school. And um, he, you know, tells a story. In our Bible college, students were not allowed to marry, to date one another. But um, I was a teacher and Nick was a student. We're the same age. But there was no rule about students and teachers. And so... <laughs> He found out from my best friend that I swam at six o'clock every morning in our local swimming pool. So he, um, every, I'd done that for a year, never saw him once. Then all of a sudden I'd go to my local swimming pool and there's a guy doing laps up and down the pool. And I'm like, after a week, I'm like, Nick, what are you doing here? He goes, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm always here at six o'clock in the morning. I love swimming at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now church, I've been married to the man for 16 years. Never once. In 16 years, has my husband got up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go swimming? Because you do what you want from passion. No one makes you get up and read your Bible. No one makes you get up and pray. No one makes you get up and lead your people. No one makes you get up. It's something that comes out of the inside of you. And my prayer would be more than anything else that you leave this conference full of the passion and fire of God. That'll take you over the line more than anything else. Did you notice when Mel Gibson did the movie The Passion of the Christ, he did not call it the boring religious obligation of the Christ. <laughs> he called it the passion. Mind you, two weeks after that movie came out, we were in a restaurant and Jim Caviezel was there. And I'm not normally starstruck, but after that movie, so very inappropriately loudly, I yell across the restaurant, oh my gosh, there's Jesus! And Nick goes, Christine, you would think you might know the difference. And then, um, and so the guy that was with us said, I know Jim, do you want to go meet him? I'm like, my heart's beating. I'm walking across the restaurant going, I'm going to meet Jesus. I'm going to meet Jesus. Anyway, I get there and I'm standing and he's sitting. We're the same height. And he's looking at me. And all I could think about was his eyes. They looked just like the movie. They didn't use filters. I was like freaking. Anyway, the guy said to him, didn't tell him what I did. He just said, this is my friend Christine from Australia. And Jim looked at me and he goes, you're from Australia? And then he stood up. I couldn't believe it. And he looks down at me and he goes, there are not many believers in Australia, are there? I couldn't believe he was talking to me. That uh, This is what I said. I went, no, no one believes in Australia. There are no believers. <laughs> and then I'm 
not joking for the next 15 minutes. He just full on started witnessing to me everything, the blood, the cross, the resurrection. He was so passionate. I did not have the heart to tell him I was a Christian. I mean, he was going for it. I had already made up my mind 10 minutes and if he was going to ask me to pray the sinner's prayer, I was down. I was praying. Passion. There's a lot to be said for passion. And if we are going to see a generation rise up that knows the Lord and the works that He has done, then we ought to be passionate. There ought to be a fire that says, I am not dropping the baton in the exchange zone. Therefore then, since I am part of such a greater cloud of witnesses, and in Hebrews chapter 11, He listed men and women that were part of that great cloud of witnesses, just like you're sitting in the grandstands today. There are the great heroes of faith that have sat in the grandstands that are cheering us on that just wish they were alive right now. Just thinking, if I had the technology you had, if we had the equal opportunity that you have today, imagine what we could do for the sake of the gospel. Imagine how much we could advance this, the kingdom of God on the earth. Imagine how famous we could make the name of Jesus Christ. If we could do what we do a time in history when you can have on one stage a Pentecostal man, a Benedictine monk, a, 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 the Bishop of London, whatever I am, shove her up there as well. The fact that you can put all of those people on one platform at one time in history and say we are all united under one name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's pretty awesome. It's a great day to be serving Jesus. It's a great day to be serving Jesus. I don't know what you're depressed about. We're leaders in the kingdom of God. If you're wondering what our job profile is, you and I are personally responsible for the evangelization of planet Earth before the second coming of Jesus. I'm telling you, I know you British people are really proper. So even if you're sitting down having dinner with a high court judge and they're trying to impress you with what they do and then they say to you, what do you do? You just go, I'm personally responsible for the evangelization of the planet before the second coming of Jesus. What do you do? It's pretty awesome. I don't know about you, but that's a fairly awesome job profile. We are charged with a responsibility, therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Church has cost me everything. I grew up in such a staunch Greek Orthodox home. This is not what a Greek Orthodox mother plans for her child. Every Greek mother... If you've seen my big fat Greek wedding, then you've seen my big fat Greek life. And every Greek mother would love her child to be, you know, married at three, kids at four, great grandkids at five. And so I did not, I'm a Greek Orthodox mother's nightmare. I did not marry until I was 30. I didn't have my first child until I was 35 and I'm a Pentecostal preacher. It does not get any worse for my mother. It's kind of like, what did I do wrong? It cost me everything. I encountered Jesus. And I wish I could tell you that I was really smart, but I'm not. All I know is that I was once blind and now I see and I met him 23 years ago and nothing's changed. Sure, by the grace of God, I have the opportunity to be a leader in, in a very influential church. I have, by the grace of God, the opportunity to run a global anti-human trafficking initiative that sees girls rescued, that just this year alone, in Greece alone, has seen eight traffickers go to jail, all for over 15 years, all for over 108,000 euro fine, by God's grace, with shelters in the Ukraine and shelters in Bulgaria and in Greece and right here in England. So many different initiatives happening and working with the fantastic work out of HTB, and the Wilberforce Trust, there's so many great things happening. But it doesn't get any more complicated than the same kid that fell in love with Jesus that said to my family, I, 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 I met Jesus. <laughs> I just met Jesus. And it's all still about that simple in my life. And that I trust he who promised to be faithful. The writer to the Hebrews said, since we're surrounded by generations before us that have come. Because if you don't remember that there are others that have come before you, you might just forget that there are still others to come after you. And if you forget that there are others to come after you, you'll drop the baton of faith. You'll think it's an option to quit. You'll think it's an option to compromise. You'll think it's an option to just kind of cruise out. 
And you'll forget that you and I are not a product of time. We're a product of eternity. God has plucked us out of eternity. He has positioned us in time. And he has given us gifts and talents for the purpose of serving our generation. It is our time to run with the baton of faith so that we can pass it on to the next generation should the Lord tarry. He says, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you. And see, as leaders, we have to lay aside weight and sin sins. And that's what hinders us more than anything else. A lot of the vexation that Judah was talking about is the weight and the sin. And the fact that the writer to the Hebrew says weights and sins suggests to me that there's a, a difference between a weight and a sin. And sometimes the things that hold us back in our leadership really isn't maybe an overt sin, although it could be, but it could be a weight. And you go, Chris, what could be a weight? A weight is a thing that has brought you this far, but is now becoming an anchor, a hindrance to taking you further. It could be a way of thinking, a way of even understanding God, a way of understanding your theology. And it's brought you this far. It's good. It's not a sin. But the truth is, in order to go to the next level of what God has for you, you need to allow yourself to be open to Jesus revealing himself more and more and more in your life and through your life. Perhaps it's Issues of your past, like me. You see me today and think, wow, look what you're doing, Christine. But you know, I'm the kid that should be the most, or the least likely to succeed, to be honest. I was um, born second generation migrant Greek in Australia when it was not cool to be Greek. Um, we were very marginalized because of our ethnicity, very, very marginalized. My brothers were beaten constantly. Our house, we had to have bars on the windows. We were very uh, ridiculed and persecuted for being Greek in a culture that did not in any way esteem women, very, very marginalized because of my gender. In the poorest local government area in my state, in a government housing house, the third poorest local government area in all of Australia is where I grew up. Abused pretty much every week of my life from the time I was three years old until the time I was 15 at the hands of four men every week. Most young women with that kind of background don't normally end up doing what I'm doing. They end up either drug dependent or alcohol dependent, maybe two or three different kids to two or three different fathers, gay or at the very least confused about their gender identity. And the reason why it gets so quiet in a room like here is you don't need to be a prophet to understand that with thousands of people. Many, many of you understand what that is in some way, shape or form, whether it's sexual or verbal or physical or emotional. I had a lot of weights. I had a lot of sins. I was full of unforgiveness, I was full of shame, I was full of bitterness, I was such an angry young woman. I couldn't look anybody in the eye. I was so broken, so many patterns of destructive behavior in my life. I was a train wreck just waiting to happen. And when I was 33 years old, two weeks before my 33rd birthday, I got a phone call from my brother George, because when you're Greek, all your brothers are George or Con or Spiro. But anyway, George called me. <laughs> And he said to me, Christine, I just got a letter from the government department and it says I've been adopted. And I laughed when he told me that because you know when you're growing up, you never think you're related to your siblings. You're kind of like your mother's from Mars. But anyway, I said, George, obviously the Department of Community Services has made an error. Why don't you call them back and then call me back? He called me back and this time he was sobbing. He said, Christine, it's true. They told me. They told me the name of my biological mother, my biological father when I was born, when I was immunized. They have a whole file on my life. I couldn't believe that it was true. So he's um, crying. And I don't know if you know much about Greeks, but Greeks are very volatile. They act first and think later. So I'm thinking, my father died when I was 19. My brother's going to go home to my mother and confront her. And he was very capable of doing anything. I'm thinking, this is going to snap. I jumped in the car, raced over to my mum's house. I walked in just at the moment that my brother was giving my mother this piece of paper from the government department. My mother took it, I saw this moment of hesitation in her eyes and I thought, oh my gosh, this is true. My mum started crying. She goes, George, I'm so sorry. All of the adoptions, they were closed adoptions in Australia 35 years ago. We never thought you would find out. And the last thing I promised your father before he died was that I would never tell you. So I tore up all of the paperwork, I threw it away. And you got to understand, church, it was a moment. My brother was crying, my mother was crying, the dog was crying, snot was flying. I mean, it was, it was a moment. 
I did what any good Greek girl would do. I went into the kitchen, sort of made coffee and baklava, and I'm sitting there, and um, my mother about, comes in about 10 minutes later, and she said to me, just out of nowhere, she goes, Christina, since we're telling the truth, do you want to know the whole truth? I don't even know actually why I said this initially, but I, I didn't even know. I said, I've been adopted too. And with tears streaming down her face, she just nodded her head. I, I stood there silent, which in itself was a miracle greater than the resurrection of Jesus. But anyway, so um, and she, I stood there silent. And then the next thing, the, the first thing that came out of my mouth a few minutes, I went, am I still Greek? And I just thought, because I was called a lot of names at school. I wanted to know there was a reason for it. But anyway, I went, am I still Greek? And church, this is the next thing that came out of my mouth right there in my Greek Orthodox mom's kitchen. I went, oh, well, before I was formed in my mother's womb, whose ever womb that was, he knew me. He knitted together my innermost parts. He fashioned all of my days before as yet there was one of them. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I said that out loud. And that day, every fact that I thought to be true about my life changed. What my name was, what my whole history was, every fact changed. And to this morning, I still don't know the facts surrounding my conception. I don't know if I was the result of some one night stand. I don't know if I was the result of an adulterous affair or, or, or a rape. But I have discovered there is a force on the planet much higher than the facts, and it's called the truth of the Word of God. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 does not say that I am the workmanship of a rape. It doesn't say that I'm the workmanship of an adulterous affair. It says that we are His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them here on planet Earth. And I am living proof that you can start bad and finish good in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ that He still redeems lives today. He restores and He redeems and He heals today. All the promises of God are in Him, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God. Every promise, every purpose that He had for my life. The enemy sent an assignment to try to still kill and destroy my life like He is for a generation. But you know what? Sometimes we act like the Bible isn't even true and we're leaders and we think, oh, I'm shocked. Yay, God still works. Yes, he does. This is called the normal Christian life. It's what Jesus does. God said, hey, Jesus, Christine and all of humanity has such a broken life that it needs redemption. Would you go to earth? Would you die on a cross and rise again from the dead so that Christine and all of humanity could have forgiveness for their past, a brand new start and a hope for the future? Jesus has always been in the miracle working business. He's always been in the res restoration business. He's always been in the redemption business. Let me tell you something. What is impossible with man is possible with God. God, our faith is a supernatural faith because God has always done signs and wonders and miracles. Let's not take the miracle factor out of the church. Let's not take the faith factor out of the church. Let's, as leaders, continue that God can still heal. God can still restore. God can and does still redeem. And He wants to do a great thing in and through your work, your ministry, your church, your mission, if you would just Step out in faith. If you would just believe that God still does this stuff. It's what he does. It's the only hope for our world. People say to me, how have you got so much passion and hope when it comes to restoring the victims of human trafficking? Because he restored me. And I who have been rescued have a responsibility to be rescued, to rescue others. It's for freedom that Christ set me free. And freedom is not just about me doing a little dance. Bless God, I'm free, I'm free. Aren't I cool? Aren't I blessed? Aren't I favoured? Isn't that awesome? That's not freedom. That's a different kind of bondage called pride and arrogance. I'll tell you what freedom is. Freedom is saying, thank you, Jesus, that I am free. Now the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because I can turn around and set a generation free. It's that we can set others free. That's true freedom. You can open the prison doors for somebody else. That is what true freedom is. So if you're not doing that, I wonder if you are free. And that's my greater question. Lay aside the weights and the sins. Sins of this generation, the sin of entitlement. The sin of arrogance. The sin of comfort. 
We've equated the blessed life with the comfortable life. Bless God, I'm blessed, so I don't need to do anything. There's a world dying and going to hell. I don't know about you, I still believe this stuff. I'm glad. <laughs> that passion, if that doesn't drive you, I don't know what does. If that doesn't drive you to have an incredibly prosperous business so that we can make a difference on the earth, to run a church that glorifies God, that sees lives turned around, that keeps us going day in and day out, even when persecution comes, even when trials come, even when tribulation comes in, and get the memo. It's just going to heat up. So let's get a little bit stronger on the inside so that we can endure what's going to happen around us. This was written to the Hebrews when they were undergoing so much persecution. Basically, it's like, come on, keep going, letter. And if I'm standing here doing anything else this morning, it's just, come on, let's keep going. Let's not give up. Let's not drop the baton of faith. Because it is just going to heat up. But you know what? I'm still old school enough to believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I've got nothing to fear in the world because the Jesus on the inside of me is stronger. And what's the death, the worst that they can do? Kill us. Newsflash. Death is the ultimate statistic. One out of one will die. It's okay. It's going to happen to all of us. You don't need to freak out. What we need to live like there's something worth living for and something worth dying for. Therefore then, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, there's others coming after us. Let's make a decision that we're going to lay aside the weights and the sins. I had to lay aside the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the hurt, the shame, the guilt, the rejection. I fit every government funding category in Australia. I'm like a marginalized, oppressed, dispossessed, poor, ethnic, minority, abused, adopted chick. I could make a fortune on government funding. They fund people like me. They say, we'll give you a label, victim, and we'll pay you every week to stay a victim. But you know what? I read the book, and my Bible says that he has redeemed my life from the pit that I don't need to live as any kind of victim. And if we really believe this, imagine the difference we can make in people's lives that are so broken and so hurt. I am just a picture of the mess of the world. And if Jesus could do it for me, he could do it for anyone. Even girls that are raped and abused 40, 50 times a day. I look in their eyes and I see who God made them to be. I have such hope. That's why traffickers are in jail. That's why our shelters are full in countries where they said it was impossible. It will be impossible to get registered and start in many of these countries in Eastern Europe. Christine, the Russian and Albanian mafia, there is no way it's going to happen. I love it. What is impossible with man is possible with God. With God, all things are possible. God still does the miraculous if you're willing to run. You know, it's your willingness to lay aside the things that hinder you which will determine how effective you will ultimately be as a leader your willingness to deal with the unforgiveness, the bitterness, much more than your 16 new leadership principles on how you can be slicker and better and market yourself. I'm personally anti the marketing deal. And I'll tell you why when it comes to Christian promotion. Because I just think it's interesting how nowadays in Christendom, because we have a Christian little subculture industry, that if you've got an opinion and you can write a blog, that someone you've done nothing for God, but you can just write some sort of blog. Someone is going to read that and think, I'm going to give you a book contract, and then you've still done nothing for God, and now you can go on a circuit, and now you can become some kind of celebrity based on doing nothing but saying a lot. And so it's interesting that we go, how can I market myself better? See, I'm very old school. When the prophet Samuel had to, mar uh, had to um, anoint the next king of Israel, God said to him, you go to the house of Jesse because I have chosen for myself. God's still in the business of choosing for himself who he's going to promote, contrary to what we might think. And so he sends the prophet to Jesse's house and the prophet gets it wrong. It makes me laugh. He thinks it's Eliab because we all think it's the best looking, the most celebrity, the coolest, the trendiest, the most eloquent, the greatest. He says, surely it's got to be Eliab. 
And the Lord says, no, it's not him. The father of the house gets it wrong. He markets seven of his best looking sons and says, have a look at them. They've got the best degrees. They're the most intelligent. They're the most eloquent. Their theology is sound. Their doctrine's fantastic. They're physically fit. They're awesome. They're the ones that should be promoted. But he gets it all wrong. And God says, no, 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 no. I've got my little guy in the backside of the desert. He's playing his harp and killing a few, you know, lions and bears while he's up there looking after the sheep. You know what I've discovered? If you're just in the backside of the desert doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing with exactly who you're supposed to be doing it with, when it's your time God can, and God has marked you, God will promote you. The promotion does not come from the north, south, east, or west. It comes from God. And it is God that opens doors that no man can shut. God still raises people up and puts them down. And I would much rather be marked by God than marketed by man. You don't have to stress thinking, I've got a little church in the backside of nowhere. Does anyone know what I'm doing? I'm here running with the baton of faith in my little business and I've got integrity. Does anyone really know it? Maybe I should compromise and just kind of put myself out there. My, my advice to you is keep your integrity. Hang on to your baton of faith. Keep doing what God's called you to do, where he's called you to do it. And it doesn't matter what man sees because God sees everything. And it is better to be marked by God than marketed by man. And if God has marked you and you are doing exactly what he's called you to do, where he's called you to do it, your promotion, your applause, your accolades come from God. And we work for the applause of one and we work for the attention of one. And imagine if we all really believed it. Imagine if we all believed it. There'd be no dropped batons anywhere because your village in that English country town would suddenly become really important. And how you worked would become really important. And you going after every soul in that village would become really important. And not thinking, well, I'm not HTB, I'm not Hillsong, I'm not Saddleback. Does it really matter? Yeah, it matters. It matters. Because every time you drop a baton of faith in that exchange zone, your lane is empty. We've got to start all over again. All over again. Everything you do matters. Everything you do matters. Let us run, therefore, the race that is set before us. Remembering there's a cloud of witnesses cheering us on. Remembering that we've got to lay aside the weights and the sins and we've got to run with endurance. And that's why it's not a matter of grabbing the baton prematurely and just wanting the accolades and just kind of going, well, you know, I just want the glory stuff and I'm not going to do anything if I'm not on the platform. Or I'm not going to work hard behind the scenes in my business. I just want the suddenly. God says, I can't give you any suddenly because there's no substance to carry that baton and you're just going to drop it if I put it in your hand. And it's not that he just only cares about us, but he cares about the generation that's to come after us. See, I don't know about you, but it disturbs me <laughs> that Joshua saw a Red Sea part. He saw manna come from heaven for 40 years. He saw the River Jordan push back. He saw the walls of Jericho come down. He saw battle after battle won in the promised land. And yet after him, another generation arose that did not know the Lord. I don't care how big or superstar anyone's ministry is. I care that another generation would arise after us that knows God and that knows the works that he has done throughout history. Your area of leadership, wherever God has placed you, whether you're a full-time homemaker, whether you are a corporate executive, whether you are a church builder, whether you are part of a church team, whether you are running an NGO, whatever sphere of life you are in, the very fact that you're a follower of Christ means that you should be leading somebody else. And if we are leading somebody else, then we are holding a baton of faith and everything we do matters. Don't think it doesn't matter. Don't think it's irrelevant. And when you want to give up, remember that there is another generation coming after you. The decisions I make today are not just about me. I've got a six-year-old girl and a 10-year-old girl. I think a whole lot more about them and their future than I think about me. We need a whole lot more leaders that think far more like mothers and fathers that care a whole lot more about the future of the church than they do about their own 
comfort, their own convenience, their own accolades, their own glory, or their own ministry in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We have an opportunity to do what's never been done. We actually have the opportunity to evangelize the earth in our lifetime. Potentially to see the second coming of Christ. Because in case you've forgotten, we're in the meantime. Between the first and the second. I really believe this stuff. You and I have an opportunity to do and to see what our forefathers would have longed. And they're in the grandstands cheering us on saying, could you do it? Would you guys die to yourself enough, allow your ego to be killed enough, get over your denominational issues enough? I'll say it just because of virtue that I'm here. Get over your gender issues enough that just maybe you might decrease and he might increase and that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified over England again, I pray in Jesus' name, that the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. If you believe that, why don't you give Jesus an awesome ovation because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Come on. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. We have the honor of carrying a baton of faith. We have the honor of making the name of Jesus famous. We have the honor of seeing Jesus permeate every aspect of society. We have the honor of modeling the unity of the brethren that we might be one as he is one, that the whole earth might see that Jesus Christ is Lord. By this, they shall know that we are his disciples by the love that we have one for another. Church, let's do it. Let's be committed in our lifetime that we're going to do this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I just thank you for Jesus. God has just never, ever gotten any more complicated for me. I was the abused, adopted, unnamed, unwanted kid. You stepped into my life and changed it all. And Lord, there is such a lost and a broken world that desperately needs to know that you love them, that you have a plan and a purpose and a destiny for every single life. And you have chosen us to be leaders in your kingdom, Father, followers of you, first and foremost. And Holy Spirit, I pray that in this moment you will do what only you can do. I pray that you would speak to each one of these 4,000 plus people in a very distinct, unique and individual, very specific way. And that you would put strength and courage into each and every one of us. That we would run the race that you have set before us, Father that we will not grow weary, that we will fix our eyes on Jesus, not our numbers, not our disappointments, that we won't be distracted by the cares of this world, that we won't compare ourselves amongst ourselves, but that we will fix our eyes on you. You are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. And Father, if we can all get our eyes off each other and just get our eyes focused on you, we will run in unison the race that is set before us. We will carry our baton of faith to the next generation. God, we will do the things that you've called us to do. So let us as your church remember that you are the head of your church. And then we'd stop looking at all the other body parts and we'd focus on you, the head. 
and that our hearts would grow more passionately in love with you. And because of that, in love with each other. And that a lost and broken world will look and marvel at what only you can do in your body, Father, which is to unify us and keep us all running in one direction. Jesus, have your way in the church throughout England, I pray. Lord, against all hope, in hope, I continue to believe that you can and will do something so major in this nation. Despite what the statistics say, despite what the media says, despite what the politician says, despite what the stock exchange says, I thank you that you who promised are faithful and that all the promises of God are in you, Jesus, yes, and in you, amen. And we as your church will continue to declare and decree your name that is above every other name. It's above poverty. It is above doubt. It is above fear. It is above all the hopelessness that permeates our society. We speak hope and faith and life and strength and courage in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Come on, why don't you give the Lord a mighty ovation in this place? Come on.